Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 70. I'm John Furrier with David Lawley. David, the salute. I'm in your chair. John, are you in my seat? <laughs> I'm in your seat with the microphone here. I'm in Boston studio here in the suburbs of Massachusetts. You're uh, down in the Cape. We had a great uh, team meeting this week um, here, looking at all the new research, uh, research strategies um, from the Cube research team, which is expanding rapidly. Um, which has been a great part of our system with the Cube, and obviously it's great. The greatness of the Cube continues. Free content, as everyone knows, we love doing what we do. It's it's a huge part of our mission. Um, so it's great to see the team, and uh, you know, I'm in your chair, and uh, no you headphones good, for me. <laughs> you look great. You look awesome. You should do this more often. Yeah, yeah, and uh, heading to New York City next week, and uh, going to be hanging out. So a lot of a lot of stuff interesting going on, Dave. We'll get to some of our offsite meetings. I want to share some of the, the things that's coming out of the cube team uh, that's new, that's pretty compelling. You know, it's more digital marketing, digital digital media innovation. But, you know, big news this week, you got Cisco had massive um, layoffs and earnings, um, exchange of management. Um, G2 Patel is now chief product officer. Um, Jonathan Davidson stepped down or is in an advisory role. He was one of our, our key points of contact there, both of those guys. And G2 is awesome executive. I've known him for many, many years. Um, AI continues to go. And, and, you know, today I have an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Matt Garman, CEO of AWS. Um, and I got a, a bunch of um, questions for him, but it's really kind of a feature. I want to really kind of dig in and, and understand his Amazonian perspective. Um, he is one of the uh, originals. I don't say originals, part of that wave of the cloud growth. You know, obviously, and Andy Jassy knows him well, um, and he's, he's he's true Amazonian. And so, you know, he took he took over for Adam Slesky, who who stepped down, also an original Amazonian, but you know, took the helm from Jassy um, to keep the ship going and growth going. And you you got tons of market share data there, but you know, under Slesky's watch, essentially the whole open AI war hit. You know, and and uh, AI AI generative AI categorically just spun up big time and Amazon was flat footed from a messaging in market perspective. I mean, they saw it, they saw it all. They knew it was coming. They just weren't really ready. And I think open AI popped that a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago or so. And now it's full, full blown category uh, in the industry and, and they're catching up and Matt Garman's a product guy. So I'm, I'm expecting to hear, you know, the views of how they're going to bring that scrappy culture, the Amazonian frugalness working backwards from the customer, I want to hear, you know, what the plan is. Now, remember, when we interviewed Jassy uh, in, mid, in, the, in the middle of the decade, last decade, it was obvious, Dave, what, what Amazon was. And Andy Jassy, you know, had essentially clear line of sight to the market. There was really no competition. And cloud was being dismissed. And we saw that a mile away, like we, many other calls we made, Intel call you made, the team made. So it was really easy to see what jassy was going to do we called it the trillion dollar baby kind of like a little bit over the top turns out trillion dollar market caps are happening so we weren't wrong on that either even though it was over the top but you know it's interesting dave we're living in a market where it's just competitive and look at cisco that they're a bellwether right and nvidia comes out of the nowhere so you have the um the landscape is completely changed and and because the generative ai is a new wave you know the developers and the startups which made amazon successful now they have enter large enterprises using the cloud. It's a whole other ball game. And, and what's even better is, I think the opportunity for AWS and others is that in this wave, new brands emerge. So, you know, things will come out of the woodwork that we've never seen before. We're already seeing it, right? I mean, I just interviewed Glean, a company that was founded in 2019. Um, they were doing enterprise search, but you add AI to the mix, it's not enterprise search anymore. It's basically a platform for applications. So the game is changing, and, and you're starting to see new things emerge. Not the old. It's old way and new way. The new way is coming, and the new way is generative AI, and there's no doubt about it that the user experience is going to be impacted. I mean, it's back. Search is the killer app, Dave. Google well, search, you know. Find what you're looking for and be productive. That's the theme that we're seeing. And, again, all the action is at the hardware infrastructure level. So the, we are seeing a massive massive turnover from a technology perspective at the infrastructure compute storage networking that will propel a rewriting of a middleware layer and that's clearly what's going on here so yeah, you know, i want to hear what garmin has to say he's a product guy product-led growth always wins in transition and he, as we always say in the cube you win in transition you know any like like sports and like business the winners come out of the transition stronger and and of course with all your you nailed it 
you're in that middle of that transition, that kind of trough, I sometimes call it the market vacuum, where the, the new isn't yet big enough to offset the decline in the old or the flatness or softness in the old. And of course, all this competition coming out, you mentioned search. You remember in DECA? Remember when Oracle bought a DECA and Larry Elsa said, this is, this is a killer app. And of course, search is, it has always been a killer app. Uh, Google obviously owned it. Um, and now with all this transition, I got to say, perfect timing. Lena Khan, the FTC steps in, says, let's break up Google. So yet again, way late to the party. Uh, to me, it signals the top of market power when the government steps in and says, you know, we want to break this company up. Remember Microsoft, they wanted to break up Microsoft in 1998. Right. When it was, you know, definitely peaking and you had the Internet coming in, disrupting everything. <clears throat> and then so that to me, that's a signal. It's a contrarian call that actually their market power is probably peaking right now. And they're getting competition, not only from the big hyperscalers, but startups like Glean. It was interesting. Google, I think, is an investor in Glean. And then as well from guys like Perplexity and others that are really challenging, you know, the dominant business model, which has been here for 20 years. But these things tend to go in 20 year cycles. And we're very clearly in another one. It's a really exciting time. Very hard to predict the winners and losers. A lot of differences this time around, particularly because the hyperscalers have so much money. Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Meta have so much cash on the balance sheet. And they're putting it to work. Whereas, you know, back in the dot com, we've talked about this a lot. It was companies taking on massive debt. So these guys are just taking it off their, their balance sheet where they got tons of cash. They got nothing better to do with it. And even after they spend all these hundreds of billions of dollars, they still have tons of cash because the cash flow is so amazing. Um, so they are strong. But I guess I, I hope we can talk about this, John, because I'll just say this the targeted remedies to these monopolies are always much more effective than broad sweeping changes that the government doesn't understand the unintended consequences. Yeah, and I think you're right. The day, day late, dollar short has always been the government's play. I mean, they came at Microsoft when they've already won. So this game was already over. But the wave, the next wave that they missed, I mean, think about the distraction. We've talked about this many times on the pod and on the cube at events. Microsoft, you know, yeah, they got their hands slapped, but they were tied up and distracted and you know and they missed the internet i mean they were there with internet explorer and it was kind of tied to the operating system that was the big thing uh, but they had the browser and they had market share but you know they missed the online search and that as a result they missed mobile and missed everything else so you know if you miss that window you know we've always said in the cube if you don't get out on, on that wave if, you, if you're too early you become driftwood if you miss it you miss the wave so you there's you got to hit the timing of the market and again these transitions is all about timing and that's where product-led growth leaders win, right? And so government coming in is a non-starter. But if you look at, like, say, AWS, you know, you did a lot of detailed research on this, you know, on research. I mean, compute still is their number one revenue source. They have databases. they got networking analytics. Data transfer is a big part of their revenue. But, you know, you think about Amazon, they got the higher-level service. What's it going to take for an Amazon to come back and win where their roots were and their roots were startups and developers right this is this is the core of today's battle right now you add on the scale of where they're at they have huge scale in the cloud um they got G more gpus they probably have more than meta maybe not we'll, we'll try to calculate that but at the end of the day game at the end of the day dave it's compute still right so you know we're seeing the market shift where it's not just about the gpus it's about CPUs too now, or XPUs. So you start to see the system. And again, we we always go deep on this on the pod, but I mean, this is really a shift. So if you're Amazon, you're sitting here with an edge with silicon, you have scale, and you still got your core products driving the revenue. Now, okay, what do you do? I mean, the higher yeah. level services are there for building blocks and crafting Lego blocks to kind of build solutions and build an ecosystem. But you know, they have they have they have an opportunity, but if they don't yeah. get it right, they could miss it. And if they get out too front, out front too front, they could be wrong, and then and they have to unwind everything. So there's a lot of potential scenarios for AWS where they could miss it, but there's also a lot of scenarios where they could hit it. <laughs> so yeah. you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how you know as when we get through this training phase of generative AI data, 
inference and reinforced learning can be done distributively, right? And so how do you do that? And of course, private AI is, the, is a hot trend in the enterprise. That's on-premise. So it'll be very interesting to see how all this comes together and does Amazon truly embrace the distributed computing paradigm of end-to-end -end workloads, right? And that well, is really where the applications are now. And and all those pre-existing applications are going to get retrofitted with generative AI, which means that that's going to be known workflows. Then net new generative AI native applications will emerge. So this is clearly going to happen. So if you're out there, you know, you got to watch that. If you're an IT leader, CISO or CXO or CIO or even a CEO, you got to get the devs on board and you got to have the right infrastructure. And, and that's clearly going to be the test. So the bloom is coming off the rose a little bit on this you know, Microsoft open AI relationship. I mean, you know, the data still shows it's very highly penetrated into even the enterprise. Um, and of course the adoption's amazing, chat GPT is amazing and all that. But as we've reported many, many times, the, you know, the ROI in the enterprise for AI is, is not where people had expected it to be, you know, not us. I mean, we always felt like it was going to take some time. You know, we actually, in our predictions, we said, you know, if, if 2024 is not the year of AI ROI, you know, look out because there's going to be a little bit of a backlash and that's exactly what's happening. And so, you know, coming back to Amazon, you're right most of their revenue is still compute, but it's less than 50% of their revenue. And we think that happened uh, probably somewhere in the pandemic, it dropped below you know, 50%. It was, remember, it was up over probably two thirds of their revenue going into the pandemic. And so what that talks, speaks to is a lot of diversica diversification in their product portfolio. Amazon Web Services has operating margins of 35%, which is incredible. Um, and so, it throws off a lot of cash. They've got a very diverse portfolio. And I think this goes back to something you and Jerry Chen and I talked about on the queue back in 2013. The vision was always to be in a position to provide the infrastructure to allow and the tools to allow builders to build new applications. They clearly did that um, very successfully with the cloud native apps. And now they're in a good position, I think, for the next wave of applications. But like you said, it's wide open. There's so much competition between Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Meta is disrupting with Llama, and you've got a lot of different um, vectors of competition from folks like OpenAI that are, you know, we're just named a competitor internally to Microsoft. And so people are going to be building applications on top of that. But I think that upper layer of the stack in terms of providing tools and data and services to be able to do that, that being build a new set of data-driven, intelligent applications that can disrupt existing SaaS models. Not that SaaS is going away. I don't think it is. I think SaaS companies are going to be aggressively in, in injecting AI into their products, and Amazon will be a beneficiary of that. But I think there will be new applications that emerge, and Amazon's got the best infrastructure, got great tooling. What it's lacking, in my view, John, is a coherent, unified data and metadata strategy that will allow... Uh, application developers to not only easily build and quickly build applications, but also take that that data estate and that metadata state and govern it in a very unified manner. So that's something that I'm really watching. I've asked Amazon many, many times, what are they doing about that? You know, the answer I get from the data folks at Amazon at AWS is stay tuned. So I'm hoping that at reInvent, we see you know, a glimpse or even more, maybe some products that begin to unify, you know, whether it's data zones and glue and all the different data stores that they have, those bespoke services that they have and bring those together in a unified data strategy that's a lot simpler than what we have today. I'm not unlike what Microsoft's doing, uh, but I think Amazon's, you know, generally has shown it has, yeah. it has better products and it can get to maturity faster, but, but it's got to show that it can do that or else people are going to start building apps on, on, frankly, on Google. And of course, they're already doing it on, on Microsoft, but Google is really gaining ground in the enterprise AI space. The data clearly shows them closing the gap uh, with Amazon. So Amazon's got some work to do there. Yeah, and we had a great review of Google's acceleration. You know, but back to Amazon for a second, because I think it's important you know, to, to highlight in these market shifts there's two types of moves to make, right? You you either ride the wave, but you really can't just ride the wave. You got to actually, you know, put some moves on in in the, on the wave, if you will. Uh, and then if you if you get out front, 
you become just wood. If you miss it, you miss it. But if you look at Amazon, there's two things that you do if you're a company in this in this market. You either pivot, which means you stop and turn, or you essentially increase your trajectory of what you have. And you know, Jassy always says there's no compression algorithm for experience. So so you don't want to pivot. If you're Amazon, you're not pivoting anything. You're you're, you're accelerating, and you're going to want to get that growth curve and kick up the revenue. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers that we've been tracking, um, you know, IaaS is is dropping, but uh, ML Analytics and the past numbers are are increasing. So that tells wait, you. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. It's dropping as a percentage of revenue. It's growing very dramatically, but it's dropping as a percentage of their business. So the mix is shifting, right? Yes. The revenue. Right. This is a revenue scoreboard. So yeah, good, good point. I'm glad you put that because they're they are growing. That could that could be a part of price pressure, or and also a right sizing. But but let's just go percentage of revenue because that tells a story. Um, their their revenue percentage is dropping. Okay, on PaaS, like five points or so, give or take. Um, storage is flat. Networking is flat. Security and others maybe again, a little bit. Again, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but but just so the audience understands, we're talking about percentage mix. Okay, Amazon Web Services is growing at 19 percent a year, so they're growing very dramatically. It's just the percentage of their business is shifting yeah. from compute and storage to other parts of the business. Uh, a yeah. little bit up the stack in, in software and, and services, but to other parts of the stack and data, there's certainly a lot of networking in there. But so I just want to put a finer point on that so people aren't confused. Great. And you, you kind of jump ahead on me, which was a good, good point there. But okay, IaaS, infrastructure as a service. Okay, a little bit down as a percentage of revenue. Pass is up as a percentage of revenue. What's interesting, database isn't soaring as a percentage of revenue. And we think that's going to be an area that will add up as the database market shifts to more open data formats, lake houses, we're going to see a lot more action there. But what's up, and this is the, some of the research you did, Dave, is the MLAI analytics numbers are up. So the, to me, that's a tell sign that the shift on the platform as a service side will increase. Now, when the wave kicks in, the growth on compute will continue to go, and Amazon's got levers as a percentage of revenue. So that, again, you pointed out the growth is there, but maybe they can turn that knob and give incentive. Because if you're you want performance with generative AI, you can actually get more compute. They have tons of GPUs. So the relationship between IaaS and PaaS relative to AWS will be super strategic in how do they transition here. And so, you know, as they say, sometimes you have to take a step back to take a step forward. And I think that's the move that they'll be making. I'm going to press Garmin on this, this new CEO, Matt, and he, obviously he ran the compute business as a product manager. And so, you know, he's a, he's a kind of leader where he can go into engineering meetings and and go deep at the same time, walk into a room with CEOs and talk about strategy and transformation. So, you know, Garmin's a multi-tool player. Okay. I, I can tell you that right now in an in interview many times and getting to know him. Uh, the question is, is he Bill Belichick, Dave, or is he <laughs> Pete Carroll for the Patriots? Because, you know, Bill Parcells had a bunch of disciples, if you follow football. <laughs> Bill Parcells was an offense, defensive coach for Bill Parcells. When the Patriots hired Bill Parcells, he, and then he got fired, they hired Pete Carroll, who was the Seahawks coach. You know, Matt Garman could be the Bill Belichick, the understudy to Jassy. Okay? And he can potentially build the next dynasty for AWS. Right, so if you look, I at love it, that analogy. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> now Pete Carroll was a great coach, like but he was just too nice of a guy in New England. He's like, he's out. So you know, is Adam Slepsky? Uh, he was Pete Carroll. He'll go run, get a win a championship somewhere else. But in New England, that was a key move for the Patriots, and that ran the table. Of course, the legend of Bledsoe t handing it off to Brady. The rest is history. The combination of Brady Belichick. That was a, a dynasty. But I tell you, Matt Garman could be the Bill Belichick moment for at AWS because Jassy's Parcells and then Belichick is Garman. And he he could pull it off. And he's going to see. We, we'll see what happens. Does he have a Tom Brady in the mix, Dave? I got it, John. I got to double down on that analogy. That is genius. Here's what. Here, okay. So Jassy is Parcells. I got to tell you, as somebody who lived in New England, I learned so much football you know, concepts, high level, just listening to Parcells, things like he would call the playoffs the tournament, one and done. He would say things like, you know, in the bye week, it's not a week off, it's another week to prepare. So he brought this mindset that was different. And that's what Jassy, think about all the things that Jassy, you mentioned one before, there's no compression algorithm for experience, two piece of teams, working backwards from the customer, Amazon brought so many interesting and unique concepts, novel concepts to the tech industry, just like Parcells 
you know, was, a, was, was one of the greatest coaches of all time at the time. Then Pete Carroll comes in. That's kind of like Solipsky, in my opinion, <laughs> because he was a short-term coach. But he actually got a lot of, he got a, kind of got a lot of heat. You know, Pete Carroll was only there. Pete a Carroll few was years. a great coach at USC, and he just came into the wrong situation for him. But, but then look what happened. He a great coach because then he goes on to, to win Super Bowls at Seattle, to have an awesome career at Seattle. But then Belichick comes in. So, first of all, Parcell's a very hard act to follow, just like Jassy's a hard act to follow. So, Lipsy comes in, you know, really, you know, under tough conditions, markets changing, um, you know, new players coming in for Pete Carroll, same thing. Okay, they, they move him out. And then now they bring in Belichick, who's kind of an insider, right? Belichick was a Parcell's disciple, just like. Garmin is a disciple of, of, of Jesse. It's a really actually quite a, an astute uh, analogy that you just brought in, John. I, love I, might, I might bring that up. Well, well, first of all, we know Andy's a New York Giants fan. I, I grew up in New Jersey, so I watched a lot of Giants games and, and was a Parcells fan. But remember when he came to the Patriots, he said, if I'm going to cook the meal, I'm going to shop the groceries because he wasn't the GM. Remember, he was hired as the coach and and Bob Kraft was the new owner and and that he, he just couldn't have it. He also had other parcel isms. Um, if you remember, you know, he would be like defense wins championships. He really doubled down on defense. If you look at AWS, if we're going to use the parcels as Jassy and um, Belichick as Garmin. You know, Belichick was a specialist. He was a defensive genius. He really ran the defense on the Giants, and Parcells relied on Belichick's genius um, to do that. Garmin was the genius behind EC2, okay? EC2 wins championships, Dave. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, and so now now he gets promoted. So now the question is, Garmin has to have a great, coaching staff if he's got to have a great staff and if he tries to come in and do what Parcells did or Jassy did he'll fail now remember Parcells and Belichick got to a riff with the Jets remember and they didn't talk for years until finally they got together so a little bit different that dynamic there but you can't Parcells didn't want to be I mean Belichick didn't want to be Parcells he wanted right. to be his own thing. And again, I think I think that's an analogy here with Garmin is that he has to be the Pars, uh, the, the Belichick to Parcells. Similar DNA because they came from the same family tree. By the way, Parcells spun off a ton of head coaches from his his lineage. So, you know, I think Amazon has to go back to that. And, and I've been critical of Amazon. A lot of great players from the, the Jassy lineage has flown from the coop. And so they're out there in other companies. So there's a there is DNA there, Dave. But yeah, I and, mean, I, and I think I think what Garmin would say to this whole you know percentage of has versus is, I think he would say that we have the strongest silicon diversity in the industry, which is true. What they have done with Annapurna and Nitro and Graviton and Tranium and all you know all their their ARM based uh, processors, they've got a lot of experience there. And I think he would say we really like our position there. It's just the mix shift is a function of our innovation and other services. I think that's how, that's how I would answer the question about <laughs> Matt Garmin. And there's, and there's demand for those services. The other thing I'll tell you about the numbers, and I've been going deep on this, as you know, the Azure numbers are a lot lower. The, the IS and past numbers for Azure are a lot lower than people believe. When Microsoft, Microsoft reports uh, Azure, they have a specific number. They give growth rates. And we dug into those redacted or poorly redacted court documents and then discover that magic $34 billion number. People who are close to this know what I'm talking about. When you go back to their fiscal year from, from the, the end of 22 to the beginning of 23 and add it up and try to map it to 34 billion and compare that to what most analysts publish, <clears throat> the number's actually quite a bit lower if you, if you anchor on that 34 billion. So the point is that Microsoft's business is a lot more weighted toward SaaS. OK, and so that's really that what they lead with. And then they sort of drag along the infrastructure, which, you know, most people feel is somewhat subpar to, to Amazon from a security and a, and a hardware diversity. And it's just a you know competitive standpoint. Having said that, you know, software is a better business than hardware generally from a from a margin standpoint. And so, you know, both very strong uh, teams, if you will, to stick with that football analogy. Yeah. But I think that at the same time, John, that means there's more upside in a sense for Amazon to the extent that they can move into that SaaS business with things like Q, uh, and, you know, and other capabilities that enable the ecosystem, which of course we know they both take they take a, a percentage of that and it sells more 
uh, uh, tools and services and IaaS and PaaS for Amazon. So I, I like their position. Uh, they, like you said, he's got to draft well. He's got to build a strong team and uh, and then, you know, win championships. It's funny. You know, I, lo I love we love football analogies. So we, why are we riffing on? But I think I think it's a good comparison. And I think, you know, back to Parcells defense wins championships. It's how you run the offense and defense and and what every team has an identity. Right. So, you know, some people have, you know, uh, remember the West Coast offense and you had, you know, the East Coast, you know, smash mouth football. I think Amazon has to have that identity. And I would say that if defense wins championships is the is the football analogy with Parcells and say Belichick with this example, I think Amazon's you know defense wins championships uh, moment is the silicon and the infrastructure. Clearly, they're, they're, it's their wheelhouse. Now, offense would be the apps, Dave. So they have a huge ecosystem. And you look at the, the, the other hyperscalers, they're bundling in their SaaS products. They all have SaaS. You got... Google and Microsoft weigh heavily on the offense there, which is the SaaS apps. Their infrastructure is weak. So I think, you know, if you're a strategist, you say, hey, if my defense is the strength, I got to win on the defense. Microsoft's clearly playing the offense with the apps. But Amazon has the ecosystem. So the, the, the Tom Brady persona out there that they need to bring in to create a dynasty has to be on the apps, Dave. And that's why I come back to the startups and the developers and the ecosystem. A Amazon's ecosystem is massive, okay? And if they screw that up, they'll have they'll put no points on the board. They can have the best defense, silicon and infrastructure, but they got to nail the pass and they got to enable that those apps. That's the scoreboard to me. And and you're seeing the Gen AI tsunami coming with apps, Cambrian explosion, uh, and I think that's it's interesting to see how each one in these clouds take their play here. So it's gonna be very interesting to see this game play out, Dave. This, it literally is it is a tournament, it is cloud wars. It is really an AI battle uh, for the for the ages, uh, and and they all got their strengths. And the the last thing I'll say about again the market and the numbers is that if you look at Google, Microsoft, and AWS, Amazon, if those three companies, and you just isolate on IS and PaaS, Amazon has more than half the market amongst those three. If you add in PaaS or you just isolate on, on SaaS, rather, if you add in SaaS and isolate on SaaS, I, Amazon has very little share in SaaS. I mean, it's mice nuts. Okay, so that is upside for them. So to the extent that Microsoft, for example, its mix shifts toward hardware, its margins are going to get negatively affected. To the extent that Amazon shifts toward SaaS, its margins will be positively affected affected so i totally agree with you that is their opportunity and builders are the key to that so dave we got some earnings coming up next week um we saw um a story this week from bloomberg which basically took our dna from our super cloud 7 the snowflake databricks battle and also we put out the killer survey to kind of get that trend going uh, and the press picked up on it uh, but it was really about you know, the, the 38 people they so-called talk to, uh, and we documented that. So go back to podcast or go watch our SuperCloud 7. You get all the data on, on our analysis, which is right on for Databricks versus Snowflake. Um, but Snowflake's earnings coming out, and we've been talking to both Snowflake and Databricks, okay? And Warren Buffett, you pointed out yesterday to me, dropped all the Snowflake shares. So what's going on? You, you and I have been on both sides of this. I've been digging deep into Databricks somewhat into Snowflake. You've been digging deep into Snowflake and somewhat into Databricks. So I think you and I collectively probably have a good read on this. I can give you my perspective on Databricks side, but we, you know, you're know you closer to the Snowflake situation. Earnings are coming. Um, you're seeing, I mean, a big move by Buffett gets to your attention. I mean, he's a long game player. Dumping all his position uh, is interesting. Yeah, so, what, what is your take you know, on, on this Snowflake situation? So here's my take. Buffett's always said, I don't invest in tech because I don't understand it. And it, to me, it's very clear he doesn't understand tech. I mean, he got lucky with Apple. Lucky. Who, who said that? Buffett. Okay. He said, I don't bet. I don't invest in tech because I don't understand it. Now, he's invested in Apple. And, and you know, he, he got obviously good investment, great timing. You know, he invested in Apple based on the cash flow and, you know, the dynamics and the fundamentals of the business and the stickiness of the business. It's kind of like an insurance annuity. And obviously, it was a massive home run. It became, you know, the, the, the largest. You know, he probably had an iPhone. I love this company. <laughs> well, right. And so, he sells, so he sells half his, his, his Apple stake. Okay, great. Check. You remember the investment he made in IBM in the, during the Gini, uh, Rometty era? So he made a big investment there and then backed out. And, and, and the time to invest in IBM was when Arvin came in, when, when IBM was at the bottom. So he missed that. He didn't understand the dynamics of the industry. My belief is the only reason he invested in Snowflake is because 
you know, he came in very late. It was right before the IPO. He got the friends and family price at $120 a share. And they said, listen, you can't miss on this. You're going to be in the money from day one. This thing's going to run up to 300. Frank Slootman, he's, he's, you know, magic man. And that's exactly what happened. The, the intriguing thing to me is that unless you knew somebody, you could not buy Snowflake shares at $120 a share. IPO, that's the IPO price. So he got it at the IPO price. Day one, it shot up to the high 200s, maybe 280. It hit over 300 at one point. Snowflake had a $100 billion market cap. It's interesting that Buffett sold sometime last quarter. So my guess is he had about six, 6 6.1 million shares. I think he probably bought in somewhere in the six to 700 million range. You have to do the math in the mid 700s, I guess. And then sold probably somewhere in the 1.2, 1.3 billion, depending on where the stock was when he sold. So it's a nice return. You know, he got 50% on his money, but it took four years to get there. So, you know, he, he wanted out. Uh, he got out when he could get a profit. Snowflake, you know, shares are clearly under pressure. Analysts are cutting their stock, their targets from you know 200 down to 130. The thing basically is bopping around close to its IPO price. And so he's tapping out. Now, what's happening in the market is I think Ali Gosi described this very well. He said the market has shifted pre, pre uh, you know, tightening. Nobody cared about cost. Well, we care about saving a little cost on storage and compute. It's cheap. Grow, grow, grow. And that's when Snowflake was taking off because of its simplicity. Now cost, cost optimization has come in, cloud optimization has come in, and people are saying, hey, I don't need Snowflake to do all this grungy data engineering work. Let's take it outside of Snowflake. Let's bring it into Databricks or bring it into some other Spark, you know, execution engine. You know, maybe it's Amazon. And we'll do the, 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 the heavy lifting there for a lot less. And so that has put pressure on Snowflake. Uh, in addition, they're clearly seeing competition from, from Databricks and others. Um, but Snowflake still has outstanding product, really loyal customers. They got a great roadmap, awesome engineering team. And their future, in my opinion, Snowflake's future, like we're talking about Amazon. By the way, Amazon, uh, Snowflake, very Amazon-like you know, in, in the data world. And so they kind of track Amazon you know, growth-wise, optimization hurts them. Amazon starts growing again. I think Snowflake will start growing nice, accelerating growth. But their future to that to the point is in the application layer, being essentially the platform to build intelligent data apps. And that's a big bet that they're making. Uh, I know Databricks is making similar bets and they've got different paths and different strategies and different religions on that. But Snowflake has a really good shot at being that platform because they're so simple. They have the iPhone-like you know, integration. And I think that's gonna play very well in the next 10 years. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think, and we've been tracking some of the platform claims um, and I call it reading the fine print. People always think, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, you see a great ad, it's like credit card charges don't apply. I mean, all kinds of like fine print in these tech cloud games these days with data specifically around Snowflake. And if you look at Snowflake, they're under pressure too. Remember, they were the data cloud. That's what they called themselves. Um, AWS called them an ISV, but we call them a data cloud. They have a platform, they have an ecosystem and great customers. Databricks is even going more platform. They're targeting developers. So there's this race and this real pressure on companies to restructure their data. The question is what will Google, Amazon, and Microsoft do? And they have to address this data lake situation. And and the fact that customers will go to data lake. So this is gonna be a moment where, you know, it kind of fits in the past layer, I kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, but also I, as Amazon has always been, we'll let the ecosystem thrive. Why would we want to compete? Because they make money, a lot of money on I, as. So be very interesting, Dave, to see how this shakes out. Because if Snowflake's under pressure from the hyperscalers, okay, that could put pressure on them. So the question is, you know, how does this all fit out? And they're all launching, you know, open, open table formats. Um, everyone's open sourcing everything. Um, and, you know, Benoit uh, Degaville, who came to the SuperCloud event, and as did Ali Gatsi, uh, we're very clear that they're being aggressive at each other. And this is what Bloomberg obviously goes for the red meat and their story. They want to create, you know, oh, look, they're going to war. 
I mean, they are kind of getting more aggressive against each other, but it is a rising tide. The the modus operandi was before was, you know, let's not throw stones at each other. We both live in glass houses. Let's just keep it the way it is. And then we are different. We both have different customer bases. And you pointed out with the research team on the Cube Research that there's a lot of overlap in the accounts. So the question is, do you see the heat in the kitchen rising relative to the Snowflake data bricks situation? I do. I see I see much more aggressive posture because of claims, especially Databricks making some really bold claims, Dave. So, you know, Snowflake, I consider like, you know, like more like an HP, very professional organization. They got a lot of big clients. Uh, you know, Databricks came from Berkeley at <laughs> University of California. They're like, they're, 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 they're aggressive. I mean, this, they're pioneers. They like to, they like to cause trouble uh, in a good way and to disrupt. And obviously they're, they're number two. So you got the two company cultures. What's your what's your take on that? I mean, that's I mean, to me, I see a lot of heat rising up. It's almost like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I won't say Boy Scouts versus <laughs> it's the, the street gang. But I mean, what would you how would you describe it? I don't mean to call Snowflake <laughs> the Boy Scouts, but they're very professional. No, they kind they, of are the, wait, no, they kind of are the Boy Scouts. I think it's a good analogy. I mean, I mean, Snowflake, I, I'll tell you my take. But first of all, the point you made about the rising tide is right on. I mean, that is this is not. Hortonworks and Cloudera all over again. Uh, they both had crappy business models, in my opinion. You know, Cloudera missed the, the cloud. Hortonworks, you know, couldn't make money. Uh, both of these companies can make money. Both of these companies have developer ecosystems. Both of these companies are in the cloud. And both of these companies are leading in innovation. And in, in, in Snowflake is catching up in AI, but it's got, you know, some really good AI chops that it's brought in. Here's my take. So, we had a follow-up with Benoit Dajaville, uh, George, and myself, and uh, and you guys were away. We would have invited you. We did invite you, but you were away. He basically pointed out, he said, you know, you guys bought in to the, at least I'll use my words, but basically this is what he was saying. You bought in to the Databricks parlor trick of uh, open sourcing Unity. He said, if you go into the GitHub, and we've looked at it, and, you know, I think I think we can confirm this, but we've got to dig in some more. You go into the to the the portion of Unity that is open source, and you know, there's not much there. It's pretty lightweight. Versus his claim is that Polaris, you know, we did a lot of the work uh in our open sourcing Polaris, it's got a lot more robust governance. Now, Unity, you know, has robust governance, but his Benoit's claim is that portion of it is not yet open source, not truly open. You were poking at Ali on this with regard to what can you read? Can you really write? Yeah. And, you know, George Gilbert is really all over this, but the 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 portions of, of, of the Databricks stack that are truly open source where you don't need any Databricks tooling, um, there's some work to do there. Whereas Benoit's point is, look, Polaris, you don't need any Snowflake to run Polaris, I should mention. Polaris is the open source governance uh, uh, platform that Snowflake announced open source. Unity is the governance platform that Databricks has, which they open source at uh, the Databricks uh, Data Plus AI Summit. But Benoit's claim is go go do the, the digging and see how much is really open source, how much code is actually in there. I will say this. I think both of those platforms are immature. I think there's going to be a very fragmented governance market. I think Ali Goetze's right that Snowflake doesn't want to open up. If they didn't have to, they would keep everything proprietary and be able to protect their margins and sell their value. But they had no choice. And Benoit admit this. Hey, this is what customers want. We got to go where customers are. These are market forces. And so that's what Boy Scouts do. They listen to their customers and go there. And so I think the market's going to stay very, very fragmented. And I think that long term, to the extent that stays the case, that does favor Snowflake because that will basically force customers if they want integration, if they want tight governance to stay with Snowflake, but to the extent that the open source community can step up and provide that robust governance. And, and, and the other thing is we just remind people that the Databricks bought Tabular for a couple billion dollars. They spent a lot of money to basically get talent. Okay. They don't own Iceberg. Iceberg's open source, but they got talent. And, and Ali's going to take that talent and he's going to try to bring Delta and, and an iceberg together, those are the open table formats, to create a unified governance framework that you can apply unity to and then obviously sell the 
the Databricks tooling behind that. That's their strategy, very different strategies. If the open source community can deliver on that promise, then that's an advantage for Databricks. But I do think that's going to take some time. All right, great. That's great, great, uh, great, great analysis there. Uh, I agree. I mean, I think to me, it, here's my final thought on this. Um, they will continue to do that. And our SuperCloud 7 event, just to put a plug in for that, it was, was called Get Ready for the Next Data Platform. And by design, you came up with the, with that slogan uh, with Rob Hof, our editor-in-chief of Silicon Angle. And, and what, what we mean is, is that there is going to be another platform emerging. It will be a combination of something stitched together from the industry that has to drive application developers to be more productive and in line natively into the applications as generative AI becomes a true secular trend. And it's already a secular trend. I mean, category, new, new category. It's a secular trend. It's an inflection point, whatever you want to call it, but that is coming. So the question is, to me, I'm watching very closely is the open table formats, okay? And then the governance catalog as a new enabler, not the old way, the catalog of the new way as data should separate from the database. And that's why I brought up the database revenue with Amazon as a percentage of their revenue. It may look different, and ML analytics might be where that goes because where does governance sit? Whole open questions. We're going to watch this. We don't know the answer. But to me, developers will be onboarding into these apps big time. And so whoever can really enable the developers that will create new startups, and new opportunities. Now, the question is, will that be a Snowflake or Databricks? Remember, Snowflake came in from the analytics side. Databricks is coming in from the platform side, and they're kind of almost on a, on a, on a collision course. And that's why there's a lot of overlap in the accounts. So I think the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> will it be Databricks or Snowflake? Yes. Yeah, both. The they don't, they're not going Absolutely. away. No one, no one loses. Now, right. if they get too toxic in their battle, I think that's where it's going to hurt the industry. It's kind of yeah. like when CrowdStrike and Microsoft had that big snafu and the security uh, hack or disruption. It wasn't a hack. It was really a blow to the industry because what it just causes people to stop and pause. So I think there's no incentive to you know go all in and, and go nuclear to, on each other. And you, know, you can point nukes at each other. Okay, whatever. Cuban Missile Crisis situation going on, whatever. I think they just got to dial it down, let the air out of the competition, and again, let the co let their products do the talking. Because if we got we bought into the quote parlor trick, I think these referring to Ali Godzi's messaging to us saying or his coming on our program and saying that it's all working. I mean, I call it a parlor trick. I call it marketing. Um, so open table formats will happen. If they don't, Dave, we're back to the old siloed warehouse model. You can't have fragmentation in, in a market that needs unification. Yeah, and by the way, I, I just he didn't use those words. Ben, why, that, that was my words, the parlor trick. But that's what he implied. This was bullshit. I mean, was, he, was, <laughs> he was pretty forceful. He didn't use that word either. <laughs> uh, well, Dave, let, next week, uh, is uh, interesting uh, conversation is going to be happening. I want to get, because we talk about this all the time, and you know, I have strong opinions, as do you, on, on Bitcoin and blockchain. So um, Salt, which is a, a, a company that does all kinds of you know, new financial stuff, they're a global investment platform. They're holding an event in Jackson Hole next week, uh, the, block, the Wyoming Blockchain Symposium 2024. Bill Tai is going to be speaking there, Cube alumni. Um, you got, you got um, Tim Scott, U.S. Senator from South Carolina, a lot of government. You know, and, and why, why I bring this up is because there's an interesting momentum going on around what came out of the Nashville Bitcoin event. Trump was there. Now there's a whole Kamala Harris for crypto. Um, crypto is like looking like gold right now in terms of how governments are looking at buying it. So there's a real effort. And Trump said when he's president day one, first of all, he's going to do a lot of things on day one, apparently. But he, his his narrative, which you know got attention and people liked it, was day one, I'm going to create a reserve, a Bitcoin reserve. I'm going to have the U.S. government buy a boatload of Bitcoin and use that as a, a, a treasury. This is, would be a historic moment for the industry because what he's basically saying, and, and the chairman, executive chairman of MicroStrategies, which was the first corporate company to do this, Mike Slayer, he's, he's been the first to bet on Bitcoin, basically saved the company. So he's got, he's holding Bitcoin in massive amounts 
and he's his earn his his returns are better than Nvidia's according to him, and he presented. So there's a movement for holding Bitcoin. So hence the in these global advisory platforms are jumping in. The Salt, the Scaramucci's on this thing. You're gonna see all kinds of action, um, but the financial innovation is coming. So we're now post the shitcoin era. We're now back to business. And we've said this, you've been very aggressive on this. And, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't against you on this one, but we didn't really debate. It was more of, you know, you were more aggressive. It's happening sooner. But I said, there's going to be a gap. And that gap seems to be closed. That Bitcoin and blockchain specifically is becoming now financial distributed infrastructure. So this is happening. This event is notable only because of if this idea of a treasury in the government and corporations start adopting Bitcoin reserves like MicroStrategies did, you have a whole different look on capital markets, investment return, and in the scheme of things, Bitcoin's still a sliver of financial instruments. If you look at other, other things like bonds and other instruments, it's still tiny on the global scale. So like gold back in the day, why wouldn't we go to the Bitcoin standard? It, it's a very interesting conversation and debate, Dave. And because remember, if we bogart the Bitcoin in the US, we're essentially taking away other countries from getting it. Remember, it's, it's, it's a scarce resource, which, which means the price will shoot up through the roof. Yeah. Well, so you, of course, recall mid last decade when we decided to go deep into the crypto world, uh, Bill Tai and some of our connections helped us get a great spot at, in the Bahamas for you know one of the the Polygon uh, Polygon uh, Bitcoin conference. And then we you did a bunch of stuff in Puerto Rico. You did some stuff overseas. Uh, we did the, uh, the 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 activities in in Toronto. You and I went up there. And we learned a lot. And I will tell you, you know, the narrative of the media trained. Um, talking heads, many of them came in the queue, we'd ask them about crypto, and they would really be, oh, we don't want to talk about crypto. I like the concept of blockchain, but I don't know about crypto. I was always the opposite. I always loved the killer app, which was money and crypto. I don't know about <laughs> blockchain and the enterprise, uh, the performance. You know, no, no, I'm saying that. enterprise buying Bitcoin. As yeah, no, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm just sort of doing a, a, an intro narrative here. Um, and so... So now we're in this weird era. So people look at Bitcoin as a store of, you know, store of value, which I, I actually do agree with. Some people disagree with that. But you also have this, it's an asset class that people are coming in investing in. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily trade the way gold would trade. You know, on a day when you would think, um, you know, the, the market's going to crash um, and, and gold is going up, Bitcoin crashes. It trades actually with the market, which is actually kind of an interesting dynamic. But here's, here's the irony. So Bitcoin, you know, was created by Satoshi, whoever she or he is or they, um, during the financial crisis of 2008. You know this for a fact. I've seen some yeah. interesting videos on whatever, but, but hold that. Thought. I think I know who Satoshi so, is. So hold on. I want to come back to that. So, uh, <laughs> that'd be awesome. If you can break that. So it was created because the, the government was printing all this money to get us out of this. You know, they first of all, they put us into this mess. With the banking, you know, crisis and the uh, uh, the the mortgage crisis, and the government helped create that. Banks helped create that. Government and banks are in bed together. So Satoshi said, "Wait a minute, let's create our own currency and get get in, get out of this. We can print money anytime we want. Nonsense, because that's going to you know defeat the purpose of having stable economies. And that's what you've seen, you know, over the course of many many centuries, where you know people print money to invest in the." economy they grow up and then take on more debt and then they drown under that debt so the here's the irony if the government creates a bitcoin reserve and starts buying like tons of bitcoin first of all i love it because i invest in crypto but where are they going to get the money to do that john they're going to print it okay the whole concept of bitcoin of we don't want to be printing money the government's going to print money to buy bitcoin and I think that is a bit of a concern because we have this huge 33, 34 trillion dollar debt. You know, Trump's just going to add to it. Biden added to it. Kamala is going to add to it. Nobody seems to give a crap about the debt. Ah, don't worry about it. And uh, so, so our, really our debt, our debt, our debt in the U.S. 
is greater than the entire wealth stored in Bitcoin. Yes, well, sixteen trillion in Bitcoin. It's, it's going to go up. If, if, if the <laughs> just, put it in price, just put it in perspective. I mean, they can literally yeah. buy all of Bitcoin right now for sixteen trillion. Uh, I thought, you know, I, I thought Friedberg's analysis on this, you know, the one guy. I don't know if it's true, but I, I believe it. He said that roughly thirty percent of the jobs are either directly government jobs, i.e., you're employed by the U.S. government, or they're contracts that are leaded that hire, you know, private companies that are government contracts and so that they're essentially 30 percent of the employment in the united states is government funded and that's just too much government my well, well my, here's my take on the bitcoin thing and i like michael slayer um slayer's opinion on this um he is the executive chairman of microstrategy and remember microstrategy was kind of sliding they were kind of i won't say going down but they weren't necessarily on a going down no, they were going okay, down. I, I they was were... being polite. Okay, they were on, they were on a downward trajectory. <laughs> they and so they bought Bitcoin and turned the company around. So Michael uh, Sa Sailor is going around saying, "Look at this changed our company," and they have an intricate system of how they manage their Bitcoin. They've been buying and reselling. It's just it's an economic machine now. So that's in, in a use case in and of itself. And they're the first early adopters of corporations to come in to do that. Now I think a corporate adoption will be a thing. We're going to watch that closely and we'll analyze that. But here's my take on the Bitcoin. If you look at how people store their wealth, you, me, people listening, you know, you put them in the equities, stock market, you buy bonds, you hold the money, cash, you buy real estate, you buy art, you buy a car. I mean, people do stuff like that to store their money. So what happens is over time, because of inflation, that wealth is deteriorates. So Slayer's argument, which is actually log logical, is that, okay, will Bitcoin go up over time? I mean, real estate lasts the longest. Money, cash, doesn't. The equities has a time horizon. You can, you can store all your money in equities, and you're subject to the market. And, and with inflation and other factors, that wealth grows, but so does inflation. So his argument is that right now, all the global wealth that's stored in equities, real estate, bonds, money, in equities in, 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 in the market is about $115 trillion. Real estate, three hundred fifty trillion bonds, three hundred trillion plus money, cash, one hundred twenty trillion. Okay, art because it lasts a long time; it's durable. Eighteen trillion Bitcoin. I mean, gold is sixteen trillion. Okay, Bitcoin is a trillion. Okay, I misread. I, I misquoted the number before. A trillion. It's tiny. So the argument is, Bitcoin because it's digital, will be a better store of wealth. If digital, if digitization happens, so if we move to a fully digital culture and world, Bitcoin will be the store of currency and store of value. And so from on the scheme of the landscape, it's so small in the percentage. So if the government goes in with the reserve, the statement there is we are going to store wealth because as Bitcoin becomes the flywheel for commerce, the argument is pretty sound that Bitcoin it will be involved, and it already is. So a trillion is nothing. So Bitcoin has to grow as a percentage uh, of equities, bonds, real estate, and others. So I, I would consider Bitcoin, like real estate, durable yeah. and lasts a long time if it's part of the system. And so you just connect the dots. It's a big bridge to cross, but if you jump across that bridge, you say, okay, if I bet on Bitcoin, what's the chances that Bitcoin will be relevant in the next 20, 50 years? Will it be a store of wealth and be used in commerce and value? It's a question. I think it will be. It's yeah, already kind of, it already kind of, the, the horse already left the barn. The genie's out of the bottle on this. So the question is, if it's a trillion now, Slayer argues that, argues that the price is going to shoot up even higher. Yeah. So I so think the government move on this is, as a leverage, global leverage, U.S. could have a leadership position on all financial wealth storage and commerce activity in a digital culture. Yeah. So, so first of all, I love Michael Saylor and I love MicroStrategy and there's what they're doing. They had a, a, a managed decline software business that was cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what he basically said is, I want to take that cash. We're going to invest in Bitcoin. 
and the, and basically pivoted the company completely. They're basically a Bitcoin company, right? They're a crypto company. They're not a software company anymore, but they're just a crypto company has software that can throw off cash and they can use their balance sheet to buy Bitcoin for you, the, the investor. So the reason why I love that is because you can buy an ETF, you can buy a Bitcoin ETF and you can pay the fees. But if you buy MicroStrategy stock, they're going to buy Bitcoin for you and you're not going to pay fees to, to for them to have you, them manage that portfolio. So it's actually a genius trend. A more, his point is it's a more efficient way to own crypto than anything else. Well, his, 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 point, his point also, Dave, if you think about this, traditional banking, the old system isn't set up for the scale of digital. So right. if right. you want to preserve so, wealth, Bitcoin is viable. It's not like it's a haymaker. It's like, well, it's, no, it's, it's not even, do it's working. People are making bank on it. I mean, we when we when we started Silicon Angle, Bitcoin was twelve cents or something like that. So, yeah, so it's so, it's definitely so, changing. So so that's a very efficient way to, to own it. The second thing is we're what sixteen years into Bitcoin um, and crypto. It is the greatest asset class of any asset class of all time. Okay, and it's got sixteen years of history now. Uh, and so, you know, the question I have is with the halvings. And, and the, the greater difficulty in mining, do the miners at some point say, eh, you know, and give up on it? You know, there is a way to create more Bitcoin. It's very hard to do. You got to get more than 50% of the holders to say, okay, we're going to agree to, to increase the float um, and print more Bitcoin. Uh, the probability of that, at least in the near term, is very low, in my opinion. So I like the long term, you know, outlook for Bitcoin as a store of value. I still like Ether. You know, Ether's kind of up and down. It hasn't tracked Bitcoin as you might have thought it would because it's got some other competition. But, yeah. you know, making, making, you know, creating solidity and making uh, uh, the, the platform programmable yeah. is what Ethereum did. And to your point about distributed finance, you know, it's yeah. going to take a long time to build out that infrastructure. But the innovation is there. I think a lot of the developers, you pointed out this in an earlier QPod this year, got sucked away into AI, but I've always thought that AI and, and crypto will come back together. And I think that's happening. I think security, AI, and crypto are, are blockchain and or distributed infrastructure will be the key areas for the future. Now, what I, what, you know, just to kind of go a little bit further and, and take the discussion into old way, new way, we always talk about that with these waves. Um, what got my attention on this whole thing was, obviously we've been following Bitcoin since, since the beginning, is that this whole idea that, that Saylor is talking about is really about preserving um, uh, wealth, but he talks specifically about dilution of capital. Okay. And, well, uh, and that's interesting because, you know, we, I, I'm not a big financial expert in terms of how the, how the, uh, the, all the underbelly works in terms of these financial institutions. I mean, I know how it works, but like not in the weeds, but he points out that inflation is just the tip of the iceberg on dilution of capital and wealth. He talks about regulation, taxation, competition. Here are the things that he, he presented, and I want to get your reaction to this. These are the things that, whether you're a business or individual, if you use Bitcoin in an increasingly digital world, here are the things that you can avoid with Bitcoin because it's digital currency. Tariffs, tolls, torts, which is legal, trading, transfers, insurance, storage costs, spreads, licensing taxes, VAT taxes, excise taxes, capital gains, income, dividend, inheritance, gift, properties, competition, weather, accidents, war, crime, regulation, obsolescence, in incompetence, politics, and catastrophe. These are all factors that will, will risk with traditional systems. I mean, will hurt or potentially dilute capital and, and value of capital. I mean, think about it. Taxes, global trade. Um, fees storing the money i mean there's all kinds of little things and you, and you go wow that he's kind of like is on something here like this is interesting to me because he's not i mean that's all factual i mean if, if something happens like in, in a hurricane hits if you own real estate and you don't have insurance you got insurance premiums on your real estate you or you don't have insurance and the house burns down you lost everything right so if it's digital then you got to have digital currency I mean, so to me, this is interesting. So does the old systems that have all these built-in risks besides inflation, that's a capital issue. So if you want to preserve wealth, Bitcoin yeah, I, is it. 
I, I, I have 5% of my wealth in, in, in crypto. And if that goes to 50%, yeah, I'll, I'll be diversifying. But <laughs> And if it goes to 0%, yeah, it's not going to kill me. So, I mean, I think everybody should have a little crypto in their portfolio. He, he talks about um, a normie a double maxi and a triple maxi if you're maximi maximizing it. Uh, triple is you put all your stuff in crypto. Um, and, I, you know, he says you should diversify, you know, convert to Bitcoin, start doing everything in Bitcoin. I mean, that's a hardcore, but, you know, I mean, th I think people should generally put 30% of their wealth in Bitcoin like they would in equities. I mean, remember, the advice is, you know, put 30% put in risk capital um, and 70% in, in steady, you know, foundational uh, preservation. So pretty aggressive because of the volatility. I, I wouldn't personally be comfortable. I, I, like I say, I got 5%. It, it fluctuates. Sometimes it goes down a point, up a point, whatever, but 30% boy, you'd be, you'd be puckering up when the Bitcoin takes a big hit because it always does. And it rises. You'd be, you'd be on cloud nine, but yeah, I think that's a, a very aggressive stance. What, what's been the biggest swing in Bitcoin pricing that you think is material that would make someone pucker up like that to use your words? You know, pucker factor. If you oh, I mean, That's even what's, I mean, I mean, what's we, been the we drops? Saw, we saw the thing go from what Bitcoin was seventy three thousand. We saw it hit forty nine. That went from seventy three thousand to forty nine thousand in you know just a few months. Right. So that's a look. That's a huge drop. Right? I mean, a twenty three thousand point drop. You know, in a couple of months. I mean, if you got if you have thirty percent of your wealth in there and it goes down to whatever twenty percent of your wealth, you're going to be like, whoa. So in, in so, 2021, Bitcoin was uh, on January, January 2021, 40,000, yep. roughly, and right? It went, now it's 50, up, 58, 59,000. It went up to 73,000, went down to 49,000, bounced back up to 53. So it was hovering around six. To me, right now, technically, I think it's building a base somewhere in the high 50s, low 60s. And I think it'll it'll either go sideways there for a while and I think take off again, or it'll 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 break that, you know, 49,000 support level and it'll can tank back down my strategy in, in bitcoin and crypto has always been when it runs up i take 10 percent off the table and then when it drops like a rock i try to pick the. i've never picked the bottom you know i'm always catching a falling knife because it's impossible to pick the bottom yeah. but when it drops i try to i try to buy it back and so i never i never sell at the top because i can't pick tops and i never buy at the bottom because i can't pick bottoms but i try to I try to sell when I feel when I'm feeling pretty good and I say, wow, this is unbelievable. I go, shit, I better sell about 10%. So I do that. I trim it, comes it goes up. Invariably it'll go up after I sell. And I'm like, crap, I shouldn't have sold. But then it'll come back down. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna buy. I start buying and it keeps dropping. And then all of a sudden it starts going up again. So that strategy has worked well for me for the last 10 years. Well, I mean, in 2022, December was 16,000, almost 17,000. And in 2019, it dropped as low as 3,700. Uh, right. So, I mean, we look at the numbers. And, then, you know, the high watermark at the beginning was 19,000 in 2017. Obviously, it was in the in the 1, 2,000 ranges in 2017. So, you know, when you look at the numbers, it really kicked up really in 2020 during the pandemic and kind of stayed there. So if you draw the, the graph, it's down. I mean, it's, it, it's up and then it's kind of cresting. So the question is, does it kick back up? So if you draw that on the technical analysis, that's what it looks like. And you can see the double tops. You see the double tops in 2017 and they couldn't get through that and it crashed back down. We maybe experienced something similar to that again. And I think I like Ether. I mean, I, we, I think when we interviewed Anthony DiOrio, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Started investing in that, invested in Solana, uh, got some other distributed you know, uh, DeFi like Ave and some others, but I think those big three. I think Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana are, are worth looking at. Well, one thing I'm watching, and just on a personal note, is how the Bitcoin billionaires, millionaires, and billionaires move their Bitcoin into asset other asset classes um, as they diversify. We're already seeing venture deals and investment deals being done internationally uh, with Bitcoin. In the sense that you've seen the corporation MicroStrategy again is a great example. I love that company. I love those people. Now I'm gonna. I'm really kind of impressed by that, by by um, by what they're doing. And so the question is, will you start to see venture funds, real estate, more conversion of the asset spread? It's gonna be interesting. Or they just hold. Um, but yeah. Well, Dave. I mean, it's been great. 
I love sitting in your chair here, and uh, we didn't get to all the great stories on SiliconAngle.com. Go to SiliconAngle.com if you're listening, and check out all the stories. Rob Hope and the team over there are doing a great job. They're constantly getting the best stories, what's happening in real time. Uh, the Cube.net is where we all, all our videos and our shows. And you see a lot more action, I think, at the end of this year, rest second half of the 2024 you're going to see a lot of action in, on our side. I didn't have a chance to go into it in this pod. Maybe the next one about the media innovation that's happening in the marketplace with us and others uh, and the decline of the old media is happening. AI is certainly impacting media businesses. And, you know, I feel really great, Dave, about uh, how we're evolving. Just, I mean, we just, we're on the wave making a little bit of moves, but uh, we're, we're just really in the right spot. And, and, and I'm really psyched for our teams and, and our Exciting customers. Exciting times, Scott. Yeah, really and, exciting. And just a lot Never of Never been more excited. I tell you, <laughs> the older I get, the more excited I get about our. I business. wish I was twenty five again, Dave. I tell my son, I'm like he's, I'm like, damn, you got a great time. You know, there's so much opportunity if you're young, and even if you look at again, not to, not to kind of extend this a little bit, but if you're an old systems guy in your fifties, okay, you've seen the early systems revolutions. We're back. I mean, that's why I think yeah. Amazon's really well positioned. Why we went on that little tangent around infrastructure and comparing, uh, you know, the coaches Bill Belichick and Parcells to how to run, you know, offense. What's the real lever in this market? It's clearly going to be infrastructure and performance, and then ultimately the scoreboard will be applications, and that's the offense. So, you know, Dave, you know, you know, we got we see who's on the field, and if, you can always win by putting on more scores on the board and let the defense. Still do good, but who, Brady used to do that all the time. You got to, you got to score fifty points to beat Brady. You know, so yeah. Is Amazon the is is Amazon the uh, the New England Patriots versus the Atlanta Falcons, or is it? It's not that bad. I mean, that they're not that far behind AI. Uh, is Microsoft the Atlanta Falcons up big time, and do, will they win? You know, I think it's. Uh... I think you got the San Francisco 49ers of old and you got the Patriots, you know, of yeah. old. I think those are the two, two come, that's the best two analogies, two great franchises with different philosophies, you know, so. All right, Dave, great to see you. Have a great weekend. Uh, Thanks, New York next week, I'll see you in New York. Um, yep. We're going to go into the New York Stock Exchange to bring in Open Bell with Juniper Networks. Uh, we'll have our Cube uh, broadcast from the show floor. We're starting to get those reps in. You see a lot more action, news coming there soon. Uh, if you're with the podcast, give us drop us a note. Tell us what you think, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.